areas programs. Other colors denote different types of natural areas programs from inactive and through various other stages of, of that gradient. Um, the history. Share your screen so that people can. Oh. Is it going? Yep. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that, people online. Um, so right now, the slide that's showing kind of gives that history, the long-term history of the state natural areas programs. And it all kind of started in 1973 with the Natural Areas Preserve Act. And the Nature Conservancy was really instrumental in all of the early phases. You can share the other screen. <laughs> <laughs> we're sharing we're sharing <laughs> oh okay this is a little bit different than doing yeah, it at i home. prefer teams <laughs> myself Make sure you can get that one. Thank you. All right. The green line around it tells us yes. that's it. No All right. <laughs> All right. So in the 70s, there was a big push to identify potential natural areas. And the idea was to create this system that was comprehensively representative of all of the ecosystems and species groups in the state. And so there was supposed to be an example, just like Noah's Ark, there's supposed to be an example of a uh, sagebrush step with um, sage grouse. There's supposed to be an element that's old growth forest with say uh, Western red cedar and redwood. And all of these different types of habitats were supposed to have an example or representative within this system, which at the time was thought to um, be a conservation mechanism. Now it's more of a museum or an opportunity for education and outreach because we know that these small little postage stamps are not going to actually conserve biodiversity at the level of the state. These are, these are tokens, but they're they're interesting tokens in that they give us a place to study these environments and monitor things like climate change or uh, other elements of, of change in these natural areas, which can be succession-based, maybe it's based on historic wildfire, things like that. It's a research venue. So in, the, in 1981, the state passed the first natural heritage plan. Uh, that The legislature approved that, but the program wasn't funded. And then through the 80s, they were underfunded, and the natural areas staff came from the Nature Conservancy. They were the Natural Heritage Advisory Council, and they sort of advised and worked with the Federal Research Natural Areas Committee to do the, the majority of the work here. State agency wasn't pushing it. Department of State Lands was involved, but most of the work was happening by the uh, Natural Heritage Advisory Council. Then in the mid to late 80s, the council started to gain authority for section six grants for invertebrates and plants. And that sticks with us to this day. Uh, the natural areas program as it came to us came with the program for section six invertebrate grants, but the plants uh, authority went to the Department of Agriculture in uh, 1987. In about 2005, DSL started talking about ways to move this program to another home. And in 2012, the program came to state parks through legislative action and the state natural areas, the state natural heritage program was renamed the state natural areas program. And it came to OPRD since then, 2012. And now the clicker doesn't work again. <laughs> Let's see if I go like that. <clears throat> okay, thanks. 
So the goals of the program as stated in the natural areas plan are to create a discrete and limited system of natural areas representing the full range of ecosystem species in the state for interpretation and education research and to establish a method for public and private sector voluntary cooperation in this natural areas program and to provide advice to managers of natural areas on the management and conservation of these sites that are registered as natural areas under our program and the principles for this program, as stated in the plan, are that it shall be complementary to and consistent with the Federal Research Natural Area Program, which will be important. I'll get to that later on. And all conservation will be voluntary on the part of the landowner. And wherever feasible, the natural area establishment should not conflict with economic uses or development. And the things that are involved in our natural areas program, as it stands now, the the gears in this system are the state natural areas plan, which is really the hub for all of the documentation of what this program is about. And then we have the register of state natural heritage resources, which includes a, a geographic information system mapping of where all of these places are, which has attributes of when they were established and who the landowner is, et cetera. And then we have the establishment files for the properties, which include management plans, uh, landowner permission letters, maps, uh, other information that's that's useful to understanding that property. And our paper records that we received from DSL when the program came to us go back to about 1972. So we have old records that are only on paper that uh, we're tracking, taking with us as we move the office around <laughs> over and over again. I have, a, I have a question going back, actually, one yeah. slide, and it, maybe this is a sure. Eve Shipsy question. Oh, the term discrete and limited, how does that, what, so, what do you, how do you use that? How yeah, you basically, that? I, I would go back to say that it's it's still that Noah's Ark thing. We don't want a ton of redundancy. We want a, an efficient, small system that's not over-representing any particular type. And I think early on in the program's history, there was a lot of concern from certain constituents that this was a land grab, mm -hmm. you know, a conservation land grab. And so from the very start, the program was meant to be, no, no, this is voluntary. We're just, we just want an example or two or three, but this is not a big land grab. So nice. thank you. Yeah. And here are the foundations in terms of OAR and ORS. The, the rules and statutes for this program live in these four different spots. First is our admit Oregon administrative rules for, for our program that we developed in 2011, 2012. Then the statutes for the state natural area program, which kind of live in DSL's uh, area since this program used to be under DSL, but all the names have been changed to support that it's now an OPRD program. And then the Institute for Natural Resources, the Oregon Biodiversity Information Center has a statutory role also in advising this program. And their ORS is listed there as well. And this program has tax implications for private landowners. And so Department of Revenue also has statutes and rules that I didn't put the rules here, but they have rules as well related to uh, how those tax benefits play out. So the real crucial piece of this is the plan. Everything is, is included in the state natural areas plan and our last officially approved state natural areas plan was from 2015. We started a draft in 2020, and then we all know what happened in 2020. But, <laughs> so we need to pick that ball back up at some point. It's basically done. It just needs to be finished off. Uh, and this is kind of the backbone of what's in the plan is the, the table that's on the right-hand side of the screen here is what's known as the data bank. So this program, since it goes back to the 70s, they use archaic words like data bank. Like nobody says <laughs> data bank anymore, right? <laughs> so the data bank is basically a database of habitat types and their locations and where we could potentially fill those ecosystem or species needs or geological needs in the state. And these, these are listed out across all of the eco regions of the state. So it goes on for you know 100 pages or something in the state natural areas plan, which actually might be a 
interesting thing for me to pass around. I have a copy of the state natural areas plan if if that would be useful. I can yeah. Chair, the discrete and limited ties to that piece where there's tax consequences. So that, that's why it was meant to be kept limited because a local government's was concerned about too much of it coming off the tax rolls. Okay. Um, so then the types of properties that are within the register include a couple of different flavors here. We've got registered sites, dedicated sites, and then sites that are passively incorporated into the program. And registered sites are voluntary and petitioned. So private landowners, NGOs, et cetera, will come to us and formerly to, to DSL to say, hey, I want to register my site as a natural area. I, it has these ecosystems or these species on it, and this is why we think it's eligible. Oftentimes that was with a tax benefit motive, uh, but the register again is entirely voluntary and it's just meant to capture the names and locations of some sites, but not to necessarily say that they are permanently protected or that they have a, a strong degree of protection. That's for the next category, which is the dedicated sites. Dedicated sites are meant to be much more formal. They're they have management plans. It takes an action of the commission and formerly the state land board to remove them from the program. And it takes a public process to remove them from the process or from the program. So they're they're much more permanently permanent, but they can be wiggled out of if, if necessary. Um, and then passively designated sites are mostly forest service and BLM research natural areas. So those are just incorporated by default as are certain landowners' lands, like Nature Conservancy preserves are incorporated by default, the Wetlands Conservancy, um, and a couple of other NGOs. However, a lot of those private landowners and NGOs will still opt to register their, their properties through the uh, petition process so that they can receive the tax benefits for so them. I have a question. Is there a presumption of that there will be public access? With all there is for for them to receive the tax benefit it has to be open to the public for at least some period of time and it has to be open for research purposes uh, as well but the rules as far as i'm aware don't spell out how much of the time they have to be open it can possibly be by invitation or appointment only they don't have to be open to the public 24 7. and if you're registered do you receive the tax benefit as well or if you you're an ngo only NGOs, only public nonprofits are eligible to receive tax benefits. A, a private citizen who registers their property can't receive a, a tax benefit. I think you just answered my question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think originally private landowners could um, receive a tax benefit, and that was removed from the rules at some point in the past because it had never been used. If I understood, you know, I've the person who knows the most about this program is Jimmy Kagan, who's now retired. He worked with Oregon Biodiversity Information Center for many years, 35 years or something. And he told me that no one ever used that and Department of Revenue removed it from their rules for some reason, so. And here is kind of the split on the register. The, the pie chart here, shows registered properties in the pink color. The dedicated color, dedicated properties are only 1% of the pie and that's uh, in a blue color there. And then the vast majority are passively included uh, natural areas from the Forest Service and BLM. And if you look at, let's see if my cursor works here. Um, the BLM has 394,000 acres in the program. So it's, it's a big chunk. Uh, Forest Service, 108,000 acres. Nature Conservancy, 100,000 acres. And then some are clear down, you know, Clackamas County only has 16 acres. So the, uh, the spectrum is wide. And this is what the map looks like of what the, where these natural areas are. Um, they're all over the state. Most of the color that you see on there is this purple color, which are the, the Forest Service and BLM mostly. Some of those are 
Nature Conservancy or other NGOs. Um, the green are dedicated. Those are the ones where they've gone above and beyond to go fill out the paperwork for a much more permanent role in the program. And then the light blue are the registered sort of uh, recognized site, but not considered permanently preserved sites. Um, and this is uh, just a snippet of the list of some of the actively registered sites in the state. There, I think there's something like 120 of them. Um, but many of these are OPRD sites, and I'll get to that in another, another slide. So uh, I already covered this. Here are the actively dedicated sites. These are the ones where they've gone to a higher level of designation. There are not that many of them, uh, and most of them are um, OPRD sites. There's some ODF there as well. And one private one uh, at Glass Hill over by um, La Grande. And then these are the OPRD properties that are registered under the program. Quite a few there. So actually, I'm going to back up a little bit to talk about um, registered sites. And this will come up tomorrow as well. There's another flavor of registration, which is the uh, provisionally registered properties, where a property is not yet meeting at the, the, the requirements for being a full-fledged natural area at the time that we register it. And they are allowed in certain circumstances to register on a temporary basis to check in after five years and we check the status of how that is looking at the end of that period. There are, there's only one provisionally registered site so far, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. So tax benefits. The whole tax benefit is related to uh, leaving a special assessment category. So if if a, an NGO buys a property that had been a farm and it was under exclusive farm use, or they buy a property that was zoned as forestry, those categories of land have a lower tax rate than they would be as a natural area. So natural areas are usually under open space or some other category that has a slightly higher tax rate. And when they switch out of one of these lower tax categories into open space or, or natural area, they have to pay five to 10 years of back taxes of the difference between the new assessment category and the special assessment category. So if the difference, so if they had 500 acres that was being uh, taxed at the, the farm use rate and say it was a $100 an acre, and they put it into open space and now their tax rate is $150 an acre, they would have to pay five to 10 years of $50 an acre additional tax that would have to be made up at the, upon disqualification from the previous special assessment category. And it, in certain cases, that can be quite a lot of money and uh, NGOs like land trusts like to use this, uh, this tax benefit to make it easier to manage the land. Uh, yeah. So just point of information, a couple of things. When the ratio from spatial assessment to normal is about 10 to 1. So it is okay. significant uh, is the first thing. And the second thing is it completely undermines local government. And I'm saying school districts and cities and counties with these kind of assessments. This one's not unique. There's probably 15 of them in the state. And so you're always going to see local government push back about a designation because it means Bob doesn't have to pay taxes on land he's using exactly the same as he was a week ago. And yeah. so it's it will always be contentious to local government. Yeah, yeah, understood. And um, for that reason, when we did rulemaking uh, in 2019, 
we rewrote some of the rules to give local government and especially county assessors a role in deciding the designation of these properties. So we provide uh, advanced warning of a petition for a uh, natural area registration. And we provide uh, an annual report of um, the natural areas that are designated in their county so that they are aware of which properties on the tax rolls are in this situation. Um, so the commission's role in the state natural areas program. So the first one is to determine the eligibility of properties and approve <laughs> registration petitions based on the information that I will provide in a commission brief um, explaining the property that's that's being uh, proposed. And this is sort of being the judge phase. And previously in 2011 and before, the Natural Heritage Advisory Council would also advise on this and provide sort of a vote amongst those council members as to whether or not the property uh, qualified and whether they recommended that property. When the program came to us, the idea was that the commission could handle that element and that it wasn't very much of a workload because there weren't very many coming through at the time, but staff would provide the rationale and the sort of uh, footwork on figuring out whether these properties met the intent of the plan and whether they met the, the requirements. The next item on the list here is to register or dedicate property. So that's basically to give the, the formal seal of approval on any um, petitions if they are to be registered or dedicated. The commission can also de-dedicate properties that are either disqualified, maybe it was an old growth forest say, and it all burned down, then it's not really representing what it was supposed to anymore. So that might be a situation where you would uh, disqualify a site and de-dedicate it. And in some cases, the landowners wish to withdraw. If they're registered, it's it's completely voluntary program, so they can be removed from the, the registry. Um, provisional registration of properties is another thing, and we'll talk about this tomorrow. Uh, provisionally registered properties have some value judgments there about whether or not the site as proposed meets the intent of the Natural Areas Program and uh, is worthy of the seal of approval. And uh, review and determine the eligibility uh, for provisionally registered properties to be renewed uh, or terminated after a five-year period of um, provisional registration. And to add federal natural areas to the state register when they are established by federal due process. And then lastly, to approve or disapprove updated versions of the state natural areas plan. And that's probably going to be coming soon since our last one was from 2015. Staff role. Uh, we manage the registry and the GIS of state natural areas and the registry files for each registered property or dedicated property. We correspond, as I told Commissioner Grasty, about we correspond with the county tax assessors regarding registrations or dedications. Uh, we receive and assess incoming registration and dedication proposals for adequacy and priority. And we create the commission briefs that you will have in your packet when a, a petition for registration is coming before the commission. We also collaborate with the Pacific North Interagency Natural Areas Committee, also known as the Research Natural Areas Committee, on sort of a bigger picture strategic view for natural areas in Oregon and Washington. And uh, we assess natural area, the natural areas system for threats and condition. This could be things like past wildfires. Uh, it could be things like, um, um, you know, maybe a species has, has become extirpated on a property for which that, that registration was dependent on that species being there. Uh, we also periodically update the state natural areas plan, the ecosystem elements list, and which is also the data bank. <laughs> and uh, we work with the Oregon Biodiversity Information Center on incoming proposals and data bank maintenance. Longer term program needs. 
We need to start thinking about climate change in our system of state natural areas. And this is something that we've been talking about quite a bit with the Interagency Research Natural Area Committee. Uh, a lot of our, our natural areas are poised to become something different than what they were originally designated for. And it would be good to look for replacements so that uh, the museum still has a representative piece for each one of those habitat types or species. We need to assess natural areas systematically that have been disqualified because of issues like catastrophic wildfires. Um, we need to update the natural areas plan and increase the program visibility and accessibility through a website. And I don't know if anyone on the commission was here at the time, but I presented a, a an idea for a, a state natural areas program website, which would basically replace that written plan and have it in a web format rather than a you know a paper document that's hard to search and interact with. It would have a database and a GIS, and you could do interactive queries and and uh, get your information needs that way. It would be good for researchers to find areas that are important for ecological research. And um, we could potentially start to fill more unfilled uh, natural area needs with state parks properties. We have a lot of places on state parks that could represent some of these open, empty cells in the plan. And it would be a matter of systematically looking for those, comparing our, our GIS and our master plan inventory holdings to see if, if we have spots that could fill some of those needs. And with that, that's uh, that's my presentation. Happy to take any questions or comments or concerns. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> to your last point, maybe I missed this earlier, but how many overall cells are there? Like, what is there an overall objective or target of how many? Yeah, types of ecosystems we're trying. Hundreds to and hundreds. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know the number, but yeah. it, it's um, it's got to be. It's got to be at least a thousand, I would think, over the whole state. The, the the total amount that we're looking to fill. Uh, no, the ones that would need to be filled. Not very many. Um, we might be talking ten to twenty that could be filled on OPRD properties. Is my guess. That's just a guess, though. Okay. And of that thousand, is that um, represent like an amount of acreage? you'd hope to be protecting as well? Or is that just sort of? We, we don't have any kind of targets for that. That's never been part of the state natural areas plan to have any kind of target acreage, but it wouldn't be a bad idea because we know that when you have a, a property that's too small, it, it's not self-sustaining. It has to be of a certain size to hit that critical mass. Yeah, I was kind of wondering like, what's the, where does this fit in the overall broader objective? Because even the way the goal's written to be, limited and discreet and solely for education, research, like where's the um, habitat for habitat, nature for nature, kind of like that larger idea of protecting. I know that what at the like international level and I think even the federal level, there's like, like 30 by 30 protecting 30% of you yeah. know, healthy ecosystems within any kind of general geography can preserve a bunch of yeah. other life forms. So I wasn't sure what's the, what's the larger how does this fit in the larger state context? Of like I think that's, that's an important thing for us to figure out now. I think we're at a point where we could start to fold in 30 by 30 into this, especially looking at it with the interagency natural areas program. And that was part of what we were thinking about when we were applying for a grant last year, which we didn't receive through the, the America, the beautiful grant uh, opportunity to, to look at the program systematically and say, is this meeting the goals? What could we do to make it actually work better you know can we have something better than postage stamps <laughs> so but that that hasn't been figured out yet yeah. okay thanks and, and that last bit i assume is also like tied into the interagency natural areas i mean because it seems like that's the scale that makes sense to have that kind of conversation absolutely you have yeah okay. yeah yeah and those are are that's a great partnership. You know, we work with the Department of Natural Resources from Washington and the National Park Service is there, Forest Service, BLM, Oregon Biodiversity Information Center, 
um, the Washington Heritage Program. All of these groups are are at the table for that. So it it's a it's a good venue for having those bigger discussions. And other state agencies here in Oregon too, or kind other, of other state more agencies. Kind of. Uh, yeah, other state agencies in Oregon have not historically been involved. Um, Department of State Lands was when this program was under right. state lands. And uh, when I started with this program in 2005, I was the OPRD representative to the Natural Heritage Advisory Council, which was then under the Department of State Lands. I think at that time, there, there might have been someone from the Oregon Department of Forestry. But since around 2005, 2008, I, I'm not recalling much participation from other state agencies. So I, I guess I'd feel remiss if I don't say this. It This is one of the programs that is really difficult for people to understand, particularly rural people. If I think about Harney County, we have six and a half million acres, acres of BLM land alone. And when somebody said, well, we need some natural area, it is impossible to do the conversation and explain to them what it is that's being done. Yeah. And so as we go forward, we need, kind of need to think about what is that argument and how do we tell a person who looks at his backyard and can see for 25 miles and there is zero development, yeah. what is it we're trying to do? And it's a tough one and just one of those issues that is specific to rural at times. And yeah, I don't know how we get there. Um, yeah. I see the importance of it and understand that, but um, explaining it's hard. Yeah, and, and I think for Harney County and, and most of the uh, southeast or, southeastern Oregon counties, that's mostly a BLM thing. It wouldn't be us looking for state natural areas. It would be us passively incorporating natural areas that the BLM designates in some other way as a research natural area or an area of critical environmental concern. But it's not something uh, OPRD or DSL have had a, a role in the past of actively, you know, pushing. No, it's been more of a passive, oh, you registered that? Great, we'll put it in our plan. <laughs> so, I, so I think about DSL and, and they have one block of land in Harney County, it's 330,000 acres. I, I mean, so. <laughs> yeah, we be looking um, at BLM. Yeah. Wow, what do you do, you know? Anyway, yeah, good on you. <laughs> and and Southeast Oregon is well represented in the in the system, but yeah. it's all federal. No. Yeah, almost they all federal. Anyway. Yeah, we can yeah. go back to that figure. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I agree that the explaining this program to to the wider world is an interesting challenge sometimes because it's perceived as something that it, it isn't often out there, and yeah. so that public outreach and education component is very important. And your idea of this making it more transparently open through uh, the web, putting the plan online and, and doing those interactive tools. I think that's that's great just to continue to get this transparently uh, out to that wider world. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's an important resource. And yet it's it, it's perceived as another layer of you know, conservation programming and and so on. It's it's different than that. It's its own thing. Yeah. And so conveying that is an important an important mandate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Noel's done a great job of making it more natural for us because even when it came in from DSL, we were like, what is this? Does this work? Like it's a tax incentive for it? Like, oh, what? Right. <laughs> Why is it here? And it never really got the momentum and traction. So it's really nice to see it feel more natural and, and better understand it, the understanding of the program and how it works and how we can actually encourage more participation actively and passively. Yeah. All right. If there are no more questions, I'll. Get out of the way. <laughs> Thank you. Nice Thanks job, for, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the You're refresher. Welcome. Much well, easier to explain it this time than the last time we did this. <laughs> and you remember. Yeah. You're like, what is this? <laughs> I don't know how to close this. <laughs> All right. So we do have a uh, uh, Jamin Lee and Nick Morris uh, joining us by Zoom here for the next workshop. I'll let them take over. Oh, I thought Chris was going to present it for us. Yes. <laughs> uh, fire hot. <laughs> just, just exhausted my knowledge of wildfires. Um, can we get that? Uh, that's, 
That's accurate, Chris. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, so, Jamin, Nick, you can introduce yourselves and then share your screen uh, when you're ready. You got it. Can you all see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, hey, everybody. So, my name's Jamin Lee. Uh, I've been with Oregon State Parks for a little over 12 years now. Um, most of that was uh, in the Columbia River Gorge as a park ranger. Is the screen shared? I'm just checking. I don't see the share, the share screen. screen around it. I see the YouTube piece, but is it shared in Teams? Uh oh. Yeah, it should be shared in Teams. Maybe it is. I see YouTube up there. <laughs> I emailed this. Sorry, Damon. Sorry. Maybe it's good. Oh, no, that's totally fine. I emailed this to Chris as well. Um, or I can send it to somebody else if they want to open it on that computer or whatever works best. That's, that's his screen. Oh, that's his screen. We're good. He's not here. Yep. Thank you. We're okay. good. Nope, you're good. Pardon. <laughs> you good. Everybody can see it. We're good. Okay. Well, I'll let Nick take it from here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, yeah, so I've been with Oregon State Parks for about 12 years now. Uh, much of that was in the Columbia River Gorge as a park ranger, and then I was a park ranger supervisor. Um, and then in January this year, I started a new role for us, um, and it's focused really on emergency management is the best way to describe it. It's kind of, um, it's under our safety and risk department, but I focus on uh, things like our wildfire response, our officer safety program, visitor safety, and stuff like that. So. Um, I've spent this past summer really trying to use my past experience with wildfires and parks and kind of beef up our response and our ability to um, react to those. Um, I've also spent the last nine years or so uh, as a volunteer first responder, so I'm trying to bring in some of that experience from outside agencies that I've volunteered with um, and apply that to us. So I'll run through what we've got here. Um, and Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Nick Morris. Uh, I've been uh, with OPRD uh, since the summer of uh, 2014, um, so almost 10 years now. Um, uh, and more recently, uh, for about a year now, I've uh, stepped into the new uh, central forester position, um, uh, handling uh, forestry issues for OPRD at the state level. All right. So hopefully this slideshow is still working. Um, this is our, our latest situation update. O ODF puts one of these out every week. Um, it's pretty helpful for us to keep track of what's going on statewide and, and what fires are going to affect us. Um, much of my summer has been spent <laughs> monitoring every time, every time a new wildfire pops up and I pull up our property boundaries and see where it's at in relation. Is this going to affect us or not? Um, and we're fortunate we have some really good partners um, that keep us informed of this. Um, so currently, the only fire that has a real impact on us right now is the Anvil fire over by Port Orford. Um, we've been just monitoring that. A portion of Humbug Mountain is in the level three evacuation zone, but it's not any of the developed areas in the park. So. Um, any questions? Yeah, yeah. The park is the bottom one on the mountain itself. The mountain itself. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I was just using an overlay of uh, OEM's map, so I thought that was a little funny too. I'm gonna ask Joe Kennick about that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have been pretty fortunate. Um, there's there's been some small small fires that weren't even really worth adding up here, but we've had seven wildfires that directly burned onto OPRD property. Um, of those, the largest was just a couple weeks ago. It was in Cottonwood Canyon. Um, that was 2,316 acres. Um, it was human caused. Um, the fire at Deschutes and Cottonwood um, had a similar origin. Um, right on the outskirts of our property along the banks of the river uh, and an area that we're not normally patrolling, but somebody floating down the river had pulled off and made a uh, some sort of a campfire. Um, and then it was either left unattended or they didn't extinguish it properly. And then with the right conditions, it took off. Um, 
we did have a couple other lightning caused fires this year. The one at French Prairie um, was smoldering for a number of days actually uh, because it was also raining. Um, but when the smoke started pouring out, that's when we noticed it. Um, same with Silver Falls. Silver Falls, we have an excellent partnership with Drake's Crossing Fire Department and they were on scene almost immediately. Um, staff and the fire personnel worked pretty flawlessly to get that under control pretty quickly. Uh, our only casualty this fire season, um, <laughs> moment of silence for the Blackberry Flat <laughs> fault toilet. Um, yeah, we're just incredibly lucky and uh, hopefully I'm not throwing, throwing them under the bus, but when I was out there doing the debrief with staff, um, this was the one structure in the park that they were kind of almost cheering that it had burned down. Uh, <laughs> they had to sacrifice something. Um, this one was an old BLM wooden vault toilet that had been partially burned in 07, rebuilt, and they it's been on our list to replace for a long time. So um, if we had to sacrifice something, we got pretty fortunate there. So mm -hmm. something I've been working on um, just from my own experience, especially with Eagle Creek fire in the gorge was kind of identifying those areas that we can kind of um, be there for the parks and their own you know staff on the ground a little better after a fire instead of saying hey let us know what you need um now what i'm trying to do is just get the region resource teams out there to actually do a debrief on the ground we'll walk through the fire area um, we'll identify with the staff of any um, identified needs any shortcomings that happened during the fire and then, uh, you know, a lot of things like, was there ground disturbance involved? Were there hand crews? Um, we're not going to be able to stop fire personnel, obviously, from digging or anything like that. But um, I think we can be a little responsive immediately after the fire to have our archaeologists go out there and do a ground survey. Um, and same with, you know, replanting or uh, reforestation needs. Um, if we can get out there on the ground immediately after the fire, that kind of takes some of the pressure off the park staff from trying to figure out what their priority is. Um, I know it's really stressful for the rangers on the ground to be dealing with a fire closure area and trying to keep the public out and then trying to, you know, I think there's some archaeology that was uncovered and, you know, I think there's a bunch of hazard trees over here and we're, we're always kind of scrambling. So that's where our, our region resource teams, which is a new kind of a newer addition to OPRD. Um, we have those subject matter experts um, in the mountain valleys and coastal regions. And then we have the central team as well, which Nick is a part of. So um, this is just an example of the debrief we did at Deschutes River where we tried to identify any needs and then come up with some uh, follow up that we could do. The other portion um, I've been working on is we have historically always used an email alert. It's called a park alert. Anytime you know one of the parks is on fire or it's something as minor as the phones are down at Stub Stewart. Um, we didn't really have a good way to go beyond that for communicating with each other other than everyone's playing phone tag and email and everything else. So. Um, in the volunteer world where I volunteer with search and rescue, we use something called Slack to communicate behind the scenes of who's headed out to the trailhead. What do you need? Do you have the litter? I'm, I'm bringing the F-350 and you can kind of see the running commentary right during the event. Um, and that was kind of our weak point as an agency is we're all communicating separately with each other. Um, so what I did was I utilized the platform we already had, which is Microsoft Teams. Um, and I kind of emulated what we were doing in Slack with Search and Rescue um, and created these Teams channels. So, and then the other idea was, you know, from my own experience seeing, uh, for example, the park manager often lives on site um, and their family's there. Uh, they're focused on the staff safety, their own family, uh, getting equipment out and getting the visitors out. Um, but at the same time, they're fielding a bunch of phone calls, you know. Um, from all different levels of managers and then the support staff, you know, what's going on with incoming reservations? Should we update the website? All this stuff is, they're getting bombarded while their park's on fire, right? So um, I created these Teams channels so that we could really focus on their next in line manager will be the point of contact. 
So, uh, for example, we had the wildfire at Hat Rock back in June, um, and Kirk Barham, the district manager for that area, was the point, of, the one and only point of contact with Steve Garcia, who is the manager that's on the ground there. So Kirk could talk to Steve, get the updates, ask him what he needed, and then post it in these Teams channels so that everybody could see without, you know, calling Steve for updates. So. I'll show you some screenshots here. Maybe it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense. So it's just, you know, giving us the ability to have a running commentary of where the fire's at, what's happening, highway closures, uh, you know, a, a heat map. Um, and then we also have people that can chime in on there. What's going on with the park hosts? Do we need a place to put them at? Um, and Kirk can think about that because he's the one that's off scene in a safe location and he can kind of be the overhead there. So, um, so far it's worked pretty well. I think, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to continue it. Um, this is another example. This was kind of a long-term one we were dealing with, you know, sailboats that wash up on the beach. Um, and then, yeah, it ends up being something that we, it's also a good place for us to document, you know, what the progression was of the owner's retrieval efforts and stuff. Okay. Fuels reduction. So I will say one fuel reduction program that's been an excellent example that's happened this year is uh, the Coos Forest Protection Agency. Um, with some of the Firewise community grants, they were able to use some uh, fuels reduction crews, and they actually hit up Nick Shepner, the park manager of Bullard's Beach, and said, hey, our crews need some experience. Um, would you mind working with us and, and letting us work around uh, creating some defensible space around some of your properties down there? Um, they work for free for us, and they got the experience on the ground, and um, I think that was a great example that came in later in the season that we're hoping to emulate. And, um, I'll turn it over to Nick. You can talk a little bit about any of your other ongoing work yeah great um <clears throat> yeah so uh as part of what i'm doing uh this biennium um i'm looking to uh put together a fire resiliency plan uh basically statewide uh for for all of the properties uh in general and more specifically to individual properties as needed um so basically a fire resiliency plan would involve, uh, among other things, it would be um, uh, ways for the parks to be firewise, um, identify defensible spaces, um, and and how the work would be conducted there to to uh, appropriately um, have your defensible spaces in place. Um, <clears throat> identify perimeter defenses. So perimeter defenses would basically be areas where we have adjacent uh, landowners um, or property uh, where we can either A, work with them in, in some way, shape or form as far, uh, for uh, fuels reduction purposes, or you know, if, it, if it's an area where you know, there's a high likelihood of if a fire were to start on that property, it would creep over to our property and it would be areas that we would identify um to 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 concentrate our treatment efforts um and then additionally there would uh be internal fuels reduction uh opportunities so plans for internal uh fuels reduction work within each park and um it would also identify additional funding uh through grant uh, opportunities um another thing that i'm working on uh, more recently is to follow up uh, with some information that's in our current uh, fire protection agreement with ODF uh, that would um, uh, kind of allow us to work with uh, ODF as a partner to um, identify and put together fire management plans for either parks or regions or MUs. Um, that, that I'm really in the early stages of that right now. So exactly how that would work, not certainly clear at this point. And then additionally, you know, um, uh, identifying fuels reduction needs as part of our biennial uh, forest management planning. Uh, the goal is always to have at least 
at this point, at least one fuels management opportunity within each region uh, uh, per biennium. Um, right now, a great example of that is the work that's going on out at Lapine. Um, we've already done uh, a lot of work out there. Um, our Valley Forester, Craig Leach, headed that up. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, defensible space work right around the campground has already been done. Um, and then we're set to uh, do another 200 acres of approximately um, under the Landscape Resiliency Program, which is a grant that's provided um, by ODF. So, so, yeah, lots on the fuels reduction end, that's for sure. <clears throat> Yeah, and more to come. I'm looking forward to working on the ODF agreement. Um, that's really about it. I mean, knock on wood, we've been very fortunate this wildfire season. Um, but uh, I'll open it up. Any questions anybody has for us? Jonathan. Um, thanks. I have a question. How are you all managing through like connectivity issues out in the field across state with between Wi-Fi and cell phones, mm -hmm. trunk radios, like, do you have that sort of mapped out knowing where you have dead spots and things like that or different? It's, it's really hard. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And uh, so another component I didn't include here is I actually set up a weekly debrief um, with all the district managers, some folks from our communications division and our IT department um, to kind of identify those things after an incident of what happened. Um, so kind of a reoccurring theme with some, especially some of our Eastern Oregon parks, um, as well as the ones in the coast region is um, connectivity and how are visitors going to dial 911, how are our staff going to get a hold of each other. Um, so one thing that uh, props to Randy Fisher from our IT department has been a big proponent of uh, Starlink. Um, so somewhere like Cottonwood Canyon actually has probably faster internet than I have at my house. Um, and uh, when the Golden Fire happened in Klamath County earlier this summer, um, they had the major communications uh, disruption. Um, our park at Goose Lake actually had Starlink already. So they were one of the few uh, parks or, or anybody else in the area. I remember getting a call from OEM. They were worried about you know, are our staff able to reach anybody? And it's, yeah, we have Starlink, so their phones are connected to it as well. Um, that said, my concern is increasing cellular connectivity for some of the harder to reach areas. So when I went out to Cottonwood after the big fire, um, there are a couple things that I identified is, you know, if we have Wi-Fi in a couple spots in the park, that's great. And, you know, the host or staff have a satellite phone for emergencies. But what I think about um, and, and also from being a first responder doing evacuations is we don't know who's going to need to dial 911. So I'd like to increase the cellular reception. So we're looking at putting in a cell booster there as well. Um, and as far as radios go, it's. I mean, to be honest, it's kind of a nightmare keeping up statewide. That's one of the things that's on my plate and I'm. I'm a bit of a radio nerd and I have a hard time keeping up with every county and especially yeah, trunked radios and encrypted radios and stuff like that. It's it's a real challenge for us to stay ahead of what's going on on the ground. Um, but we do have some meetings coming up with ODF during the off season. We've uh, improved the radios that we are using and we're continuing to kind of replace some of the older ones. So. We will have some that are, you know, P25 and encryption capable if, if need be. So we can hear from our other partners. We're not going to encrypt our radios. Thanks for that. Uh, it's good to know that there's uh, Starlink and cell reception out in Cottonwood Canyon now, having gotten stranded out there with AG ships <laughs> many years ago. I, Starlink, I've gotten picked up for that dinner out in Condon uh, maybe a few hours earlier. So. Five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was no way to call you. <laughs> yeah, and I'm told there's some different. sort of portable Starlink unit we have now. Um, I'm actually going to take it down to uh, the Collier management unit during the eclipse. Um, so we have some increased reception. So we'll see how that works. We're going to put Apple tags on all the commissioners. 
We might need yeah, to get yeah, yeah. out so we don't get lost. Yeah. And if any just the commissioners, <laughs> <laughs> maybe the attorneys. Yeah. And if nobody, if you've never been to Goose Lake, it's amazing that it's there. And I will tell you, we we're just in Southern Nevada for the NASPD meeting, and we went in early for the board meeting. We brought a portable Starlink with us to be able to create connectivity for that reason, in case somebody had a medical emergency or some other. So they're they're pretty easy to travel with. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah, interesting too. And thinking about for the public, for folks to get out there, you yeah. know, in Metro, we manage Oxbow Park on the Sandy just down from Dabney, and the cell reception is really bad. And unfortunately, we've had incidents down there and tragedies, and it's been hard for people to make calls. So we've yeah. tried to set up some of those um, other sat phones that people can see and try to draw a lot of attention to that and awareness. But I can only imagine with the 100,000 acres that you all manage across the state just how to get that information out and um, I know it's tough and we've heard from our search and rescue folks in the counties yeah. of like needing to make sure that how how parks can help to um, inform all the guests and visitors to the region as well that's a lot it's good to see the technology starting to catch up with some of these opportunities yeah I'm very familiar with the connectivity at Oxbow I was uh, stationed at Daphne for a long time and that's that's a challenge and then when we I do search and rescue from Multnomah County. So yeah, uh, we've had a number of searches in there and radio and cell receptions really hard. Um, and, you know, any any opportunity we have to partner uh, with Metro on that Sandy River corridor, I'd be open to for sure. Cause it's, it's we get a lot of people floating the river there and a lot of emergency response. And it's, it, it frightens me. <laughs> Thanks for your work and for volunteering also and having your yeah, day yeah. job and your after hours be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Um, I'll go after this. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about wondering how the partnerships are going with some of these private landowners surrounding state parks in terms of firewise work. Are they receptive? Are they um, engaged in terms of wanting to to do work if, if it's paid for by the state or somebody else uh how has your how has the the partnership aspect gone in some of these cases jamin you want me to <laughs> on that? yeah Two, three. uh you know as i said a lot of this right now is is still really early days um uh but just from work that we've done in the past um you know Obviously, our you know federal and, and other state you know uh, counterparts uh, that are adjacent to us are 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 very receptive to it, um, and uh, are you know generally willing to either you know help where they can, either either not get in the way or or help where they can, and in some cases you know provide uh, funding as needed as well. So. Um, uh, It'll be interesting um, moving into the future when we start, you know, more actively reaching out to some of the uh, private individuals to see where that will go. But I mean, I have a sense that, you know, everybody's best interest, it, you know, is to 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 protect the land. Um, so uh, I would hope that there would be a lot of cooperation moving forward. Thanks. Yeah, we I I happen to live in a firewise community and I know that it has taken a lot of education from our local uh, fire department to just get the word out about, you know, you're not you're not necessarily paying for this work. It's mm -hmm. beneficial to the rest of the community. That sort of um, efforts have, have it, it's taken years to get some <laughs> folks to a place where they're OK with some sort of um, active management on their property. So I just I'll be curious to hear how how it goes from a state state effort um and if you have tips for other folks across the state too yeah yeah i'd be glad to <clears throat> i this is uh, commissioner Dugger. i i enjoyed the discussion uh, about fuels reduction and actually would be would enjoy kind of nerding out on fuels reduction for a long time, but don't want to hold everybody hostage here. Oh. So you see some commissioners encouraging me to to stop right there. But uh, <laughs> but I would be interested in hearing more about uh, just a little more about how uh, you determine uh, where the fuels reduction will take place and at what scales. I appreciate that there are a lot of different compliance elements to that. 
uh, in terms of the environmental effects and uh, even cultural resource effects and so forth. And uh, some of that obviously reflects um, urban uh, interface issues and, and, and risk to, to specific properties and developed areas. But I'm also wondering about the, the environmental considerations. I guess this is on my mind. I'm thinking about my home community, for example, where we have a lot of um, around Oswald West is one case in point where we have a lot of downed timber. And the uh, history and research shows that after you have major events, which probably will become more numerous as the climate continues to change, such as large scale blowdown of timber, uh, or historically, even earthquakes that cause a large number of uh, trees to drop, uh, that there are, there are cycles of fire that occur after those events, uh, which is a slightly different category of, um, of fuels reduction uh, and, a, and a much different scale of challenge as well. Uh, but I know you're looking at a lot of different environments around the state and a lot of different kinds of con uh, con contexts. And so I'd, I'd be interested in just hearing how, how that is prioritized uh, as you look around the state and consider your next fuels reduction uh, projects? Yeah, uh, so, you know, one of, the, one of the other things that we're working on um, within the Central Resources uh, Group is um, uh, a climate resiliency plan, which dovetails in, you know, no matter how you look at it with the fire resiliency plan. Um, and, and like you said, um, yeah, everything indicates that you know the way that the that 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 the trajectory of climate change is going, we're going to be having a lot of these issues moving into the future, and you know obviously it's the 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 management um, is going to be you know different um, uh, you know east side versus you know something that you would do on the coast, but I mean you know that said you know, with climate change being as impactful as it is, you know, 50 years into the future, you know, we may be having, um, you know, larger scale events on a more regular basis on the coast. I mean, you know, the Sandville fire, you know, is just a, you know, a current reminder of where things are going. Um, um, but, but as far as the specific management goes you know obviously you know uh human safety is is number one for us so you know the the first thing that we're going to be looking at is a defensible space uh around where the public is and around you know infrastructures um and then secondarily will be that 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 kind of uh uh that perimeter defense um you know kind of keeping our boundaries as safe as possible um, and then um, thirdly, uh, you know, looking uh, elsewhere within the perimeter of the parks a and it, and it's, and it's going to, uh, um, aside from those first two goals, you know, the, 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 the third goal of, you know, identifying areas within the parks are, they're going to be um, uh, impactful as to, you know, what the appropriate management might be for the given, uh, uh, you know, force type you're in and, and whatnot. Um, obviously, if we're working on the coast, we don't want to just go in and, you know, take everything down to bare mineral soil and leave, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, 50 trees per acre out there. Um, we're looking to, as far as we can, a, a more natural uh, forest environment where we can have that. Um, but at the same time, uh, find that kind of uh, balance of uh, uh, ha having that natural forest and reducing the fuel load to the point where we're not going to have catastrophic fires within our parks. Yeah, very good. Uh, and I appreciate there's a lot of staff expertise uh, that, that's brought to bear on this in each case is, is unique somewhat. And I guess that part of what I'm, I'm wondering about is, is, you know, do we have a a statewide fuels reduction strategy that's evolving alongside our climate response strategizing. Are we looking at it at that scale or is it basically staff just considering these on a case by case basis with sort of a larger without a larger integrated approach? Well, right now it's it's case by case, but the, that yeah. integration is is where we're moving. Um, you, you just yeah. identified our, our upcoming project this winter that Nick and I were talking about last week, actually, it's kind of a triage uh, uh, statewide of needs. Um, and then looking at that, you know, from the 100,000 foot level of 
what yeah. we're what we're going towards. Yeah. Very good. And I think that's that's kind of where my questions were heading with the, the idea that an integrated strategy may increasingly be the way way to go. Although again, every case is different, and and uh, just on the ground. Uh, Assessments and staff expertise are really the ultimately what's what is required in all of these cases. But as part of our larger climate uh, climate change response, looking at fuels reduction as part of the bigger picture is definitely obviously going to be something we're talking about more in the future future meetings. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I was going to say I really like having our region resource teams. Uh, they're a little more specialized for their area. But then at Nick and I's level, we can look at it as an overall project. And then we can also kind of cheerlead those, uh, you know, if we have a fire protection plan that's been written by, you know, Silver Falls, for example, Craig Leach wrote one for Silver Falls a couple of years ago. But, um, you know, it gets put out there into the universe, but we didn't exactly have a plan of execution for it. So that's something that Nick and I are going to be diving into uh, this winter as well as what does that look like? Because we can't just toss that plan to park staff and expect them to, you know, turn that out along with maintaining all the trails and facilities and campers and everything else. So um, that's kind of me taking the field experience and and trying to bring it up to the the statewide level. Um, and so I'm I'm pretty optimistic about it right now. Still, yeah, very good. Uh, I guess I should ch channel for Cal Mukamoto too and say, do we ever generate any revenue through fuels reduction by selling any of the trees that we're the smaller trees that are being taken out of these places? Barely. <laughs> it's, it's happened. It's it happens. Pretty yeah, impractical, that. but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's, goal. yeah it's pretty rare. I, I've really been trying to get on the, um, the biochar bandwagon right. recently. Um, but there's there's just not a lot of movement on it yet. Um, I think there's potential, but um, yeah, it's not quite there yet. <laughs> right. I appreciate that. But I, I guess I'm asking that partially out of respect for Cal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. he, he can't ask the question here himself. But also uh, just thinking, <laughs> thinking about the the scale of potential fuels reduction needs in the future uh, and trying to offset some of the revenue uh, implications of that or, or some of the, pardon me, the, the budgetary implications of that through... Uh, something along those lines. But anyway, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from folks? No, just thanks to the, yeah, really the both of you. It. Yeah, um, especially at Jamin, adding the Teams channels made it so much easier for some of us that are constantly like freaking out, like what's happening, it's two in the morning, and being able to get into those team channels and have one single point of contact has to be much easier for the folks on the ground rather than trying to get out to 20 different people. So it's been really cool to see that. And, and to your questions, Commissioner Dewar, um, this is one of those, um, you know, there's always a blessing in every crisis, right? And so when COVID happened and we had all of our all of our crazy layoffs and Nick was somewhere else. And I mean, just the world was crazy for us, right? So when we came back and reorganized and restructured rather than centralizing those positions, we now have them out in each of the regions and the central group. And so it's allowing us to actually think a lot more globally and, and bring all those perspectives together. So yeah. the amount of progress that's been made even in the last year has been insane compared to where we were even right. pre-COVID. Yeah. And the fact that yeah. they made up to the level that they have and are as robust as they are, it's it's really kind of cool to see. So congratulations, you two. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you me. both for having us. Yeah. See you guys later. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Yeah. Is there anything else, Chris, Lisa? Or...